of our God. Oh, clap your hands, oh, you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. You may be seated. Praise and thanksgiving unto God. The presence of his spirit dwelling amongst us and in us. Clap your hands for our psalmist again. She's a phenomenal woman of God. I've been blessed all morning long by this choir and this musical aggregation and musicians, and I'm grateful, certainly thankful to Pastor Watley, your leader, senior pastor, First Lady Shauna and daughter, Allie, um, as they are getting some well and much needed rest. I spoke to him earlier this morning, we spoke briefly and I said to him, after the general conference, you need at least a year of mental health because there are such high tension moments. And he stood firmly on the floor leading the second Episcopal district. He's not just capable as a leader, but he's a gifted leader, organizer, visionary. And certainly he makes me proud. And to the staff, one of the signs of a healthy church is when the pastor is not there, the church continues to function. And so I want to thank God for this staff. They've been very, very, very kind and gracious to me. And to these uh, Levites and the musical aggregation, thank you. Thank you so much. Certainly want to salute the uh, 15th Episcopal District. Give them a hand again. <laughs> Wonderful. And we're praying for you and uh, Bishop Beeling as he shall superintend the district. Amen. I've been doing this all morning, and so I acknowledge those persons that may be with us at this service also. If you were a former member of Reed's or Reed Temple or still attend Reed, and you allowed me to serve as your pastor for 37 years. Would you please stand? I want to acknowledge you. Oh, so good to see you. Amen. I do see my brother, and uh, I guess I have sister-in-law, I guess some others that are present this morning that's been with us all day. My wife was at the other service, and so we're grateful for you. Let us pray. Now, Lord, we thank you again for this third service. We thank you for your visitation at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and now this is the final service for the day. But we're so, we're so glad that you never leave us nor forsake us. Now, speak through me, Lord, that our conviction should be such that we'll leave here changed and we go to work and continue to make disciples in the kingdom of Jesus. Bless us, we pray, and all of God's people said amen. And let me thank also Brother Andre. Brother Andre met me. He served uh, on security there at Reed Temple, and uh, we talked this week, and he said, Pastor, I'll be there. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I want us to look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 45 to 51. Uh, Mark chapter 6, 45 to 51. We'll read it together collectively. And this is what it says. Let's read it together. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. When he, after leaving them,
Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk about I'm changing seasons. Changing seasons. Changing seasons. I've always been fascinated by the seasons of the year because there's something profound and spiritual that happens as seasons change. Something in heaven and earth happens that affects light and temperature and time. And just like the seasons of a year change, our lives also go through various seasons, each with unique challenges and opportunities. There are seasons of growth, seasons of barrenness, there are seasons of ecstasy, and seasons of sorrow. The, the seasons change. And that's the pathos lifted in the wisdom literature of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heavens. Dr. Henry Cloud, a self-help Christian author, in his book entitled Boundless, when to say yes and how to say no to take control of your life declares everything has seasons and we must be able to recognize when time has passed for something to end and be able to transition into the next season. My personal experience after pastoring for over 40 years I've discovered this truth that God doesn't allow us to have a season that remains unchanged. God will not allow us to live perpetually in a fun and festive field season without a season that summons our faith. This and there will be restless days, stressful nights, you may find yourself walking the floor talking about what's going on and talking to yourself. There will be feelings of hurt and disease sometimes attack the body. Or you have children that won't listen and parents that just don't understand. Or even the death of our loved ones. There are changing seasons. A friend of mine asked me to move to Florida, gave me compelling arguments. He said, Florida is the sunshine state. We don't pay taxes. We have beaches that are diverse and options for real estate, unbelievable. We have Mickey Mouse, Disney World, and Sea World, and Universal Studios. We have the best golfing anywhere. And there's lots of fun things to do. I told him, that sounds great, but you also have tropical storms that turn into hurricanes with torrential downpours and devastating winds. You have alligators that show up in your driveway and 10 feet long Burmese pythons that decide to take a swim whenever they want to. And worse than that, you have the Satan, I mean DeSantis, who is aggravated by anything black. I said, give me winter, spring, summer, and fall. I'll visit you on Southwest I love seeing the leaves change colors and the snow covering the land and the sound of spring birds chirping and flowers budding and hot fun in the summertime because there is something profound and spiritual happening. Something in the heavens and the earth happens that affects light, time, and temperature. Gazing at our text, I noticed that there are there's so much in these passages but one thing I immediately noticed was the changing of the seasons. And that's the canvas I want to paint 
my proclamation on this morning. Jesus and his disciples are amid the miracle of loaves. Jesus miraculously takes two fish, five loaves of bread, feeds a multitude. This is the season of abundance. People are full. Disciples are enjoying the benefits and blessing. <clears throat> this is the season of success. Every believer enjoys the season of success. Health is good. Marriage is silent. Mind is sharp. Finances are strong. Extra money to do whatever you choose. It would be wonderful if we could freeze the scene or in the chapter and let the credits roll, but that is not how life works. Chapter 14, verses 30 to 44, is a season of abundance and success. Some of us know about that. Some of us have that uh, verse 30 to 44 season in our lives. Everything's going well. I mean, you're getting along well. The boss and you, you have good re working relations. It's a, it's a season of success, but Seasons change, and that one will too. Verse 45, Jesus speaks, and the scene shifts. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. The scene and season shifts with Jesus' command. The disciples weren't happy about it after all. Who wants to leave a season of abundance and success? They were having a great time. I mean, the miracle. Two fish, five loaves of bread. They round up taking selfies. And Jesus said, uh-uh, get in the boat. What was Jesus thinking? When everything was going well on the land, Jesus gives a command to leave. Have you ever noticed that Jesus cares less about convenience and more about character. There are times when Jesus speaks that makes us uncomfortable, amen? There are seasons Jesus gives us a command that we have to wrestle with, but it's necessary because if we remain in the present season, we'll miss the greater miracle of the next season. So Jesus works in every season, and we must learn to give thanks in every season. Jesus is paradoxical because Jesus knows how to change our doubts into faith decisions and change our pain into purpose and change our losses into gains. And so in verse 46, Jesus leads the disciples, goes to the mountain to pray, and verse 47, later that night, the boat is in the middle of the lake. Verse 48, the disciples are straining because the wind was against them. This is interesting because they just left a season of success and now they are in a season of struggle. What do you do when your season of success shifts to a season of struggle? You go to bed at night in a season of success but wake up in the morning to a season of struggle. The disciples' season of success abruptly ends. And the disciples are straining. They are struggling because of a divine assignment. They're struggling because of a divine assignment. Because divine assignments do not come without a tax. They're in the midst of the lake at night struggling because the wind is against them, struggling with the wind. They can't see it, but they feel it. It's like grief of losing a loved one. You can't see it, but you can feel it. It's like the grief of losing uh, a friend. You can't see it, but you can feel it. It's like discrimination. You can't see it, but you can feel it. It's like being rejected. You can't see it, but you can feel it. It's like being passed over. When someone does less but get the best, you can't see it, but you can feel it. It's, it's, it's like a nagging heartbreak. You can't see it, but you can feel it. You can't shake the trust, uh, and you, you're trying to regain it. You can't see it, but you can feel it. Dr. King knew about this struggle. He was successful and a prominent leader of the civil rights movement, but suffered from deep depression and became a chain smoker because of the, the, of the assignment that brought the assaults and the attack. If Jesus was with them, 
it would not be so bad. But Jesus separated from them. And whenever Jesus is separated from us, the separation intensifies the struggle. Because the presence of Jesus is the strength we need in our struggle. If you're in a struggle, you better call on Jesus. If you're in a struggle, you better pray to Jesus. If you're in a struggle, you better invite Jesus. Because Jesus is the source of our life. You take a flower and separate it from the source of life, it struggles, it withers and dies. You take a believer from the word of God, the source of life, that believer will struggle and die. That's why it's great to be in fellowship at Kingdom Fellowship. <clears throat> because you hear the word and the word is the source of our life. You take a church and separate it from the Holy Ghost, the source of life, the church is going to struggle and die. And I don't care whether it's the AME church or whether it's the Baptist church or whether it's the Kojic church or whether it's the Lutheran church or the Catholic church. If you separate the church from the Holy Ghost, that church will die. If you are in a church where the folk are embarrassed and intimidated by the presence of the Holy Ghost, put up your little Baptist finger and get out as soon as you can. Because the church is the place where the Holy Ghost moves from heart to heart and breast to breast. The Holy Ghost is the place that the lady just saying that will lift you up when you're falling, that will fix you when you're broken. The Holy Ghost will give you joy when you're sorrowful. The Holy Ghost will make your hand go up and you don't know why. Your feet start patting. You can't explain it. You start running. Ain't nobody chasing you. You find joy coming out of your mouth. Separate a worshiper from worship and praise and they're going to wither and they're going to struggle to survive. That's why I like coming to kingdom because I don't have to push you. I don't have to push you. I, I don't have to push you. All you have to do is have a flashback of where God bought you from. All you have to do is realize you put your head on a pillow last night. You closed your eyes. You didn't even know where you were. And God had angels standing beside you. And right early this morning, God shook you and told death to back up. And you got up this morning clothed and in your right mind. You were able to feed yourself. If they called your name, you could answer. You tell me you can't give God some praise. for. I'm, I, I, I don't mean no harm, but I can't go to a church where I got to sit up here as if I've been embalmed. I can't go to a church where I can't be free to express my goodness, to express the goodness of God to me because you don't know like I know what God has brought me through and what God has brought me out. Now, if you have not had God to bless you, you have my permission. You can act sophisticated. You can stick your nose up in the air. But if you know the Lord has been good to you and the Lord has made a way for you, oh, come on, clap your hands, all your people, and shout with the voice of triumph. I'm looking for about 10 people in here that's unapologetic because the Lord has been So the disciples are in a season of struggle. They're in a season of struggle, and they can't get out on their own. They are stranded. They are toiling. They are tormented. And at the same time, they're in something they can't get out of on their own strength. There are 12 of them. And the combined effort of them is not sufficient to get them out of what they're in. Every now and then you find yourself in a season struggling with something. You can't get out on your own. Lord, help me. Some relationships that are toxic that are like that. 
and you can't get out on your own and you feel yourself stranded. Some temptations, some habits, some addictions are like that. You can't get out on your own. I know we don't preach much about it these days, but it still happens. Sin is like that. Because sin can wrap its arm around you. It can wrap itself around you like a snake and squeeze the life out of you. And you can't get out of it on your own. But there's a name that you can call. There is a name that you can call that will allow you the freedom to break free. If they stayed on the shore, they wouldn't be in this situation. All they were doing was following a divine assignment. But there are benefits to the assignment. It's dark, and here comes Jesus walking on the water, and they're afraid, and they thought Jesus was a ghost. Fear is a Doppler radar within us that goes off when we are struggling and stranded. But fear tolerated causes our faith to be contaminated. So in verse 9, they cry. And they were troubled. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm glad the writer included this because without storm season, we become too hardy to say hallelujah. Without storm seasons, we are too proper to praise. Without storm seasons, we're too cute to contribute and too greedy to give and too sophisticated to serve or shout. But as I said before, as I come up to kingdom, these folk know the Lord, and they free to praise him. In fact, let's take a little break right here now. Can you just take a, a praise break for a minute and thank God that he's brought you up to this very present moment? I know this is the Labor Day weekend. I know that. But if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't be here. God brought you from January, February, March, April, May, June, July. So they were afraid of what they saw, but we don't live by what we see. Uh, we live by what we know, and we fight through the fear because we know what exists is not seen, for we walk not by sight but by faith. So fear says, look and see you're broke. Faith says, but my God, oh, can supply all my needs. Fear says, I told you that you wouldn't make it. And faith says, he who has begun a good work in me will complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fear says, you're going to fail. Faith says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered in the heart what God has in store for them. Listen, fear says, uh, this is it. Faith says, but all things work together. For the good of them that love the Lord and are called. So, so the challenge now is how to maintain our faith when the seasons have shifted from success to struggle and, and you're stranded. How do I hold on when life is dark and my season has me in the middle of something I don't know, I, I don't have the strength on my own to get out? Verse 45, he saw the disciples straining because the wind was against them. But the Lord sees us in every season. He saw them before they saw him. Because the eyes of the Lord watches us. He sees us. What is against us? Who is against us? In the animal kingdom, animals have exceptional sight and vision. The ostrich has the largest eyes. His eyes are larger than his brain. The ostrich can see over two miles. An eagle has great vision. An eagle can look straight ahead and at the same time look down and see fish in the water. The hawk has unique vision and can see ultraviolet colors and hunt at night. The mountain goat can go to the top of the mountain because his eyes are so positioned that he can see in a 360 degree angle, but all that's pale in comparison to the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> because the Lord's eyes are everywhere. 
at the same time. So Jesus saw them struggling. Can I tell you the Lord knows when you're struggling? When no one else knows what you are going through or can see it or understand it, Jesus knows when you struggle. Jesus knows all about our trials. He will help us when the day is through. Jesus sees in every season, and Jesus, get this, is stronger than our struggles. The disciples are struggling with the winds, the waters, and the waves, but here comes Jesus walking on the water. The winds are contrary, but not to Jesus. Waves won't allow them to move, but Jesus walks on the way. What you can't get through, Jesus will help bring you through. Uh, you, 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 you couldn't get through the sickness by yourself, but Jesus will help you. You couldn't make it through the foreclosure, but Jesus will help you. You couldn't make it through a failed marriage, but Jesus will help you. But it didn't stop Jesus from walking through to get through to you. Jesus sent his disciples in the storm because he wanted to put their faith on display. And what tripped them out was that Jesus did it on the sea. Huh. The question was raised, did Jesus walk on the water? Did Jesus float above the water? Did Jesus leap over the waves? I, I don't know. And I really don't care. All I know is I trust in God. And whenever I'm in trouble or whenever I struggle, I trust in God wherever I may be upon the land or on the rolling sea. For come what may, from day to day, my heavenly father watches over me. The disciples thought they would drown, but the sea was not their destined place. And it wasn't the place for Jesus to die. If the sea claimed the life of Jesus, there would be no salvation. But it was on a hill outside a city on a Friday. The disciples were not looking for Jesus because of the storm. If ever there was a time to look for Jesus, it's when it is a storm. You need him before the storm and you need him in the storm. When airline pilots are coming into Atlanta, they have a navigational system, a laser equipment system. But when the fog is extremely heavy, they make their final approach and they make their descent and they look for the house of hope. Now, the house of hope is a church. That's the church of Dr. Dewey Smith because at the top of the church is a huge cross. And so when they're coming in and they can't see and the navigational equipment does not bring uh, what, where they're going in the view, they look for the cross, and that's what we are told to do, to look to the cross where Jesus died, to the cross where he hung, bled, and died. Because regardless of the season, the cross is our symbol of salvation. A patient went to the doctor, and the doctor says, I'm sorry to report your condition. The diagnosis and the tests indicate there is no cure. The patient said, how long do I have, doctor? He said, oh, no more than three months. The patient left out crying, stopped at the uh, receptionist's desk, and said, the doctor just took away my hope. I wasn't expecting to hear this in this season of my life. I've lost my hope. The receptionist was a believer and a Christian, looked at him and said, man, you need to find new hope. She says, I've been a believer for some time here, yeah, and I was told my life would end also three years ago, but I'm still living because I found new hope. And she said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy lean on Jesus' name, on Christ. The solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Winter, spring, summer, or fall, all you have to do is call, and Jesus will be there. Aretha Franklin, in her version of Precious Lord, borrowed the words from Carol King's song, You Got a Friend, and she put in there, and when you know that you know that you know that Jesus is your friend, you have hope in every season, and so though the storms may roll and the withers may break, I know he holds me fast, and I shall not stray. Dark be the night, clouds in the sky, 
I know it's all right because Jesus is mine. My soul been anchored in the Lord. I've been through the fire and I've been through the flood. I've been broken into pieces, seeing lightning flashing from above. But through it all, I remember that he loves me and he cares. And he'll never put more on me than I can bear. I'm in a changing season, but God never changes. God bless you.